That is very good. The swing works the Oracle again. And the Oracle bowled in. That is out. Great theatre, magnificent drama. First match of the season, eh, huh? First match of the season, Martin. King Willow's on his throne and all's right with the world. Gods and flannelled fools. Um, <laughs> it's from a poem about cricket. Oh, very apt. How does it go on, my old hound? That's the only line I know. <laughs> oh, well, never mind, you certainly made the point. Hello, welcome to Gods and Flannelled Fools, episode 11, Dealing with Pace. This is the series in which I walk through a history of English Test Match cricket, focusing on key series, matches, players and teams of a particular interest, basically exploring the myths and legends of the game that collectively have led to how we view Test Match cricket today. If you haven't already listened, my pilot episode, A Brief History of the Game Up to the Very First Two Test Matches in 1877, uh, is available, as well as the first ten episodes in which I cover a variety of series, themes and individuals, ranging from the the early legends of the English game prior to two world wars, uh, through to the Bodyline series and Timeless Tests, and then on to post-war series of the 50s and 60s. So... Um, worth checking those out on on my channel and, and subscribing. Uh, there is a, a Twitter profile for the series, at GFF Pod, and I'll also make some notes in support of this on the blog, which is available at godsandflannelledfools.blogspot.com. Now, throughout the course of the first, te- uh, first century of Test Match history, there had been glimpses here and there of the impact and effectiveness of high pace when it came to a bowling attack and the impact it could uh, provide a captain. Now, of course, the the most famous was the Bodyline series of the 1930s, but then we also saw the Australian attack of the 40s, uh, the English side that toured Australia in the 50s with Frank Tyson, and then the West Indian opening attack of the 60s. And as we found out in the last episode, in the 1970-71 to 71 Ashes series, England brought with them for the first time a team of quick bowlers, not, re- not just relying on one. And the impact of this was that they finally managed to win back the Ashes after a, a lengthy lean period. Now this, together with the fact that the game was becoming more professional and more hard-nosed in spirit and a, and a little less gentlemanly, would pave the way for genuinely fast bowling to become one of the big developments as the decade progressed. And it would lay the foundations for what would subsequently take place in the 80s. If we move forward from the 70 to 71 Ashes series to the next away series against Australia four years later, a few significant changes took place. Uh, Firstly, Ray Illingworth, having successfully defended the Ashes at home in 1972, was dropped the following year following a loss to the West Indies. And he was replaced as captain by Mike Dinesse, a stylish Scottish-born batsman who had made his England debut quite late on in his career. Um, But he was not necessarily the most obvious choice in the role. And this was an opinion certainly felt by Jeff Boycott, who had been vying for the captaincy for a while, and who subsequently fell out with Dinesh. And after a drawn series against Pakistan in the summer of 1974, Boycott elected to make himself unavailable for England, uh, an exile that would last three years, and uh, he would cite exhaustion and stress uh, as the reasons for it, claiming he'd lost his appetite for Test cricket. Aside then from, from several omissions from the successful side of the, the late 60s and early 70s, There was one notable new face, that of the larger-than-life all-rounder Tony Gregg. Tony Gregg was born to a Scottish father and a a South African mother in 1946 and grew up playing cricket in South Africa, turning out for Border Province in the Curry Cup as a teenager. And these performances led him to being offered a trial for Sussex. And at the age of 19, he travelled to England where he made a spectacular 156 in 230 minutes against a very strong Lancaster, uh, sorry, Lancashire attack on his debut. 
he decided at that point uh, not to return to university and he set himself the goal of making the England test team within six years, playing for Sussex during the English summer and Eastern Province during the South African season. And Tony Gregg eventually made his debut on the tour to the West Indies in 1974 and was immediately embroiled in controversy when he ran out Alvin Kalicharan on the last ball of the second day of the first test in Trinidad, uh, after it appeared that Kalicharan had been walking off to the pavilion. Now, time had not technically been called on the day's play, so the umpire's decision was actually uh, correct to give the batsman out, but it was felt to be unsporting, and actually a riot broke out in the stands, with many West Indian spectators storming the pitch. And Kalicharan was, uh, was reinstated the next day with the, the England team's blessing, and he went on to make 158. Uh, Tony Gregg claimed he hadn't realised the batsmen were walking off. But despite failing with the, the bat and the ball in that first test, Gregg dominated the rest of the series. He scored 430 runs at an average of nearly 48 and took 24 wickets, most of them with spin, at, uh, at an average of less than 23. Um, he scored 148 and then backed that up with fifers in the third, fourth and fifth tests. As I say, many with offspin, which he'd added to his uh, sort of stock medium pace, which he had at the start of his career. And in the summer that followed, he continued his good form, making a century against India at Lords and averaging 41 with the bat and taking 14 wickets. <laughs> is very good the swing works the oracle again so despite a few changes from the previous series england went into the 1974 to 75 ashes series as slight favorites under the captaincy of mike diness but they had not bargained for what they were about to come up against Ian Chappell had quietly put together a very strong attacking side with strength in the batting, a quality wicketkeeper in Rod Marsh and good depth in the bowling department. Spearheading this attack was Dennis Lilly, who had made his debut four years ago, but by this stage was a quicker, more powerful and more accurate, aggressive fast bowler with all the tricks in the book. Alongside him was a new kid on the block who had sparked rumours of his extreme pace by causing all sorts of physical harm to batsmen in shield cricket, though had not really done anything of note in his test debut in, uh, against Pakistan in 1973. But Jeff Thompson had learned to bowl based on the technique of throwing a javelin, and with a short stuttering run-up and slingshot action, the ball was delivered from a bizarre wide low angle at a pace estimated at somewhere between 90 and 100 mile an hour, a speed probably not reached prior to this point in the game's, ev game's evolution, and it caused the unfortunate batsman to play everything frenetically off the back foot with little sight of the release point. As with the 70-71 to 71 tour, there were six matches scheduled for the series, with the first two at Brisbane and Perth, respectively. And with these being the quickest of the Australian pitches, and with Chapel having instructed Thompson to bowl within himself in the tour matches, the English players had little idea of what they were up against and duly found themselves 2-0 down. On the eve of the series, Jeff Thompson had been interviewed on television, appearing like a primitive version of Crocodile Dundee, stating, I enjoy hitting a batsman more than getting him out. I like to see blood on the pitch. A spell of 6 for 46 helped to win the first test, and at Perth, a number of the English batsmen were injured as he took 5 for 93 in the second innings. In response, the Sydney Sunday Telegraph ran a photo of Lillian Thompson with the caption, Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, if Thompson don't get you, Lily must. And one of these injured batsmen at the Wacker was the unfortunate opener David Lloyd, whose efforts in the second innings came to an abrupt end when he was famously felled by a fast delivery that caught him flush in the box. Here he is recalling the experience in recent years. Very partisan crowd, which is what you're there for anyway. You don't want it easy. If you're a, a visitor and you're playing international sport, uh, you know you're going to cop some and you're going to be... Uh, as an opening batsman, your number one target, if you like. David Lloyd, who's uh, in as an opening batsman, he said at a team meeting that Thompson wasn't a worry to him, 
he said that he could play Thompson with um, what is laughingly known as his appendage. And he set out and proved it. Thompson to Lloyd. And hit badly there that time. It was a nasty one. And I'm very square on. Uh, and you, you just have that moment, glimpse. Gosh, I hope this hits the bat. Well, it missed, and everybody knows where it hit me. I used to love left-handers, because of the way I bowled, they used to go away, and then you'd straighten one up and jag back at them. Well, that's what happened, and it just cleaned him up right in the midriff, and he's gone down the right. It's, it's 1974, and all cricketers would remember what, what I was wearing what for protection. There was only one thing that you wore and it was a pink thing, and it's a pink lightsome, and it had holes in it, this pink lightsome, completely useless for the job that it was supposed to do. And you can use them now in bathrooms in, in, as an accessory. You can put your soap in there now. That's about as much use as they are. I'll put this as politely as I can, that everything that should have been inside that pink lightsome had found its way through these holes and was trapped now on the outside. No wonder I somersaulted into the floor. Just landed straight on my head. There was bits and pieces hanging out everywhere. It was a very, very delicate operation, like a jigsaw puzzle, to get the bits out without doing more damage. I swear to you that that particular day, we didn't need a doctor, we needed a welder to get this box and all its contents pulled apart, so I lose, my, I, I lose my voice every February, and I put that down to Jeff Thompson, yeah. With the likes of John Edrich and Dennis Amis both injured, the selectors had resorted to calling up the 41-year-old veteran Colin Cowdery, who arrived just in time to play at the Wacker, and who arrived at the crease in the first innings, full of gentlemanly spirit, remarking to Jeff Thompson, Mr Thompson, I believe, Pleasure to meet you. To which Thompson replied, that's not going to help you, fat, so piss off. Despite managing to salvage a draw at Melbourne, England remained battered and bruised with no respite from the hostile short pitch bowling and they lost at both Sydney and Adelaide to go 4-0 down with one match to play. In the final test, also played at Melbourne, they were assisted by the return from injury of several of their top order batsmen, together with the absence of Jeff Thompson, whose troublesome shoulder injury would continue to impact his career over the course of the next decade. And they managed to register a face-saving consolation test victory to end the series with a 4-1 defeat, thus losing their grip of the ashes. Despite having a young, talented and quite balanced side, the Australians had started as underdogs, and it was ultimately the ingredients of extreme pace, backed up by a hostile, aggressive attitude, that had led to their dominance of the England team, with only Tony Gregg having the necessary characteristics and skill to stand up to the onslaught. Indeed, during his hundred at Brisbane, he seemingly took pleasure in uppercutting the Australian quicks over the slip cordon and signalling his own boundaries in a highly provocative manner. Though this inflammatory goading did little to improve the spirits of his teammates quaking at the bit in the dressing room. Much of the blame for the defeat was directed, perhaps unfairly, at the captain, Mike Dines, who was subsequently sacked at the start of the summer that followed, when Australia began their defence of the Ashes in the back-to-back -back series in England following the inaugural World Cup. A Tony Gregg's bold and fearless attacking approach made him the ideal candidate to replace Dines in the eyes of the selectors, and he duly took over the reins in the summer of 1975, continuing to mould the team in his own vision. Now, it's worth noting that it was not just England who felt the full force and impact of extreme pace bowling at the hands of Australia. In the series that followed, the West Indies, under the captaincy of Clive Lloyd, had a similar experience at the hands of Lillian Thompson and were duly hammered 5-1 in the six-test series. What added to their humiliation was the perceived lack of respect for their team and at times some racist abuse in the crowds, Clive Lloyd had for some time been planning to rebuild the side in the spirit of the successful post-war teams, using togetherness and strong captaincy to rally the various islands under one banner. 
The experience in Australia, however, made it clear that times had changed. And the most important requirement in the modern game in order to ensure competitive dominance was that of extreme pace. And when he returned home, he explained this to the West Indian board. Not only did he have a plan, he announced, but he believed he had the personnel to carry it out. Pace bowlers Andy Roberts and Michael Holding had recently made their debuts and Wayne Daniel was drafted into the home series against India as Lloyd put his blueprint into action. Their plan of short pitch bowling worked as in the test match at Jamaica, England, uh, sorry, India declared their second innings with a lead of just 12 simply in order to spare their tail enders the ordeal of facing the fast bowling. Now, satisfied with the success of the plan, and in the knowledge that there were other bowlers of a similar calibre waiting in the wings, bowlers such as Joel Garner and Colin Croft, Lloyd put his West Indian team through a series of gruelling fitness routines, determined to maximise the talent at his disposal and forge them into the best side in the world. On the eve of the home series against the West Indies in the summer of 1976, Tony Gregg was understandably a confident man, having made a strong start to his captaincy and convinced that his team were favourites to win the forthcoming contest. He was interviewed on BBC's Sports Night programme where he gave his thoughts on the opponents, including remarks that would go down as some of the most controversial and infamous in sporting history. He had to boast about was the success of the West Indies team. To a step beyond the sport where there's a whole lot of things needed defending rather than the cricket ball itself. People are building these West Indians up. I'm not really quite sure that they're as good as everyone thinks they are. If they're down, they grovel. And I intend, with the help of Klausi and a few others, to make them grovel. Grovel. They grovel. Grovel. To make them grovel. That wasn't a clever thing to say. It's commonly regarded by now that Tony Gregg didn't mean anything sinister or particularly underhand by his grovel comment. But at the time, the fact that a white South African, under the background of apartheid, which was at its height, used this word when referencing West Indians, many of whom had slave ancestry, was seen as highly inflammatory. Aside from a collection of young raw pace bowlers, the West Indies side contained many proud characters who were abrasive, often confrontational sportsmen when in the heat of battle, and Greg's comments, which went global before the first ball of the series had been bowled, were fuel for the likes of Gordon Greenwich and the talented Viv Richards. As during the Ashes series in 74-75, England's biggest challenge in 76 was finding enough quality batsmen to make the top order, in light of retirements coupled with Jeff Boycott's continued self-imposed exile from the team. The previous summer had seen a new face in the unlikely form of the Northampton batsman David Steele, a gritty and courageous player with grey hair and a quiet manner. Despite his self-evasing style, Tony Gregg had remarked that he felt tears fall onto his hand when presenting Steele with his England cap and knew then that this was quite a man who would fight me to the death. Despite not having scored a century, he had nevertheless registered four fifties and it was felt that he would help to stifle the expected onslaught from the West Indian pace attack. The other unlikely hero was the 45-year-old veteran Brian Close, now captaining Somerset, having enjoyed a long career with Yorkshire and who we must remember had made his England debut aged 18 in 1949, 27 years previously. For all the controversy, the series started with a hard-fought draw at Trent Bridge, a match in which Viv Richards made a magnificent 232 in the West Indies' first inning score of 494, a total that perhaps should have been greater given that they were at one point 408 for two. In reply, David Steele made his maiden test century, demonstrating his ability not only to stand up to hostile fast bowling, uh, bowling that other batsmen had struggled to cope with, but to attack it with fearless hooks and pulls. Although the West Indies declared their second innings in an attempt to force a result, England comfortably batted out uh, the final day for a draw with John Edrich unbeaten on 76 at the close. 
The second test took place two weeks later at Lords, with Viv Richards missing as a result of injury and Michael Holding replacing Wayne Daniel. Now here, the weather got the better of the match, with the third day being completely washed out and Derek Underwood typically taking five for 39 on a, on a damp surface. The West Indies finished their second innings on 241 for six in pursuit of a victory target of 323, though it was felt that on a quicker surface, the signs were becoming to emerge that their pace attack could actually cause some serious damage. The third test took place at Old Trafford on the 8th of July 1976, where the West Indies won the toss and chose to bat, posting 211 thanks to a century by Gordon Greenwich. In response, their bowling lineup ripped through England with Holding taking 5 for 17 and Roberts 3 for 22 as the hosts were dismissed for a mere 71. The West Indies then seized complete control of the game with a rapid 411 in only 114 overs, Viv Richards making another 100. They chose to declare soon after tea on the third day given England's victory target was a ridiculous 552 and there was a rest day before day four, which meant their quicks could launch an assault on the English batsmen before earning a day off. John Edrich opened with Brian Close, who had been promoted despite not having opened the batting in any form of cricket for many years. The 80 minutes that followed has gone down as one of the most breathtaking bursts of hostile quick bowling ever captured on film against two veteran openers on a substandard pitch. There was no limit on bounces, and only 10 of the 73 deliveries sent down by Holding, Roberts and Daniel would have gone on to hit the stumps. As the bowling became more aggressive, Edrich took evasive action, ducking, swaying and taking the odd single, whereas the 45-year-old Brian Close found himself stuck at the end that the rapidly quick Michael Holding was bowling from. As Jonathan Agnew recalled, it was the most raw pieces of cricket you could watch. A 45-year-old man up against a lithe, magnificent, young, fast bowler, bowling at his very fastest. No helmet, no chest pad, no arm guard. And he had a towel, a little thin towel, tucked inside his trousers over his right thigh to protect the bruising. He had a bat, a pair of pads, and a pair of old-fashioned gloves, and that was it. He had, in terms of bravery and determination, more than you could ever have seen on the cricket field before. Sitting hard and in typical closey style, he hasn't rubbed it. On my word, Brian Close did well to avoid quite a nasty accident there. And was really fired in extremely quickly. Only at the last possible minute did he manage to get that head out of the way. And that's hurt him. And that's somewhere I think round about the mark where earlier he let one bounce off him. That really must have stung him. Close trying to take this pace attack, but extremely difficult. Enough is enough. He's really overdone the short pictures. Brian Close is going to be a mass of bruises when he gets back into the haven of the pavilion. As can be seen from the clips available on YouTube and in the excellent Fire in Babylon documentary, Close was struck several times but refused to show pain, his knees buckling briefly a couple of times but never stopping to rub the area or calling for help. On one particular delivery from Holding, he flicked his head away from a lethal bouncer which would almost certainly have broken his skull had it struck him in the temple. Somehow, against all the odds, they managed to negotiate their way to 22 for no wicket, though Close had no end of cuts and bruises to show for it. When play resumed on the Monday, the wickets began to tumble and England managed only to limp to the fifth day, eventually losing by 425 runs and taking a huge psychological dent in the process. Curiously, after that, both Close and Edrich were dropped for the fourth test at Headingley. It's worth noting at this point the interval between Close's first and last test matches was 27 years, the second longest after Wilfred Rhodes. Only one man, Zimbabwean John Trakos, has since played a test match at a greater age. 
At Headingley, the West Indies batted first, with Greenwich making another 100 in a score of 450. And in reply, England fared better than at Old Trafford, with 387, thanks largely to centuries from Tony Gregg and Alan Knott. Bob Willis took a fifer to keep their opponents down to 196 in the second innings, but the target of 260 proved too much, with Roberts and Holding again causing problems with their pace, bowling England out for 204. Tony Gregg remaining unbeaten on 76 to add to his first inning century. This victory put the West Indies 2-0 up with one to play, thus securing the Wisden Trophy. The final test took place on the uh, 11th of August on a dry, slow pitch at the Oval, and yet again, Clive Lloyd won the toss and batted, amassing a huge 687 for eight. Viv Richards making 291, his second double century in the series. The innings is noted for nine of the England players all taking turns to bowl. Such was the benign quality of the surface and the dominance of the batting. In response, Dennis Amis led the way with a double century of his own in a respectable 435. The most notable part of the innings was the performance of Michael Holding, who despite the slow surface, ramped up his speed through the air and pitched everything up in an effort at removing the pitch from the equation, taking 8 for 92, all but one of his wickets being either bold or LBW. The West Indies didn't enforce the follow-on, but instead made a brisk 182 for no wicket declared, setting England 435 to win late on the fourth day. In the second innings, Holding increased his speed even further, watched on by the observant umpire Dickie Bird. Of fast bowling because it was a beautiful pitch to bat on. It was a batsman's paradise, but he beat the English batsman by sheer pace through the air. Tremendous performance by Holding. And in the second innings, it only seems like yesterday, 1976, Holding was bowling from my end in the second innings. And he got the first four English batsmen out very quickly. And Tony Gregg came out to bat. And he walked down the members' enclosure at the oval out onto the green out to the middle. Holding was stood at the side of me waiting for him to come out. And as he walked out, Holding said, Dickie, as you just man. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I can do this man, Greg, for a pastime. <laughs> I said, Michael, I have noticed that throughout the series. <laughs> because he used to stand with his bat up here, did Greg. And the West Indies worked it out in their team meetings on a Wednesday night before the test match started, that if they could fire what we call a yorker length ball in at his leg and middle stumps at a tremendous pace, by the time his bat came down, his leg and middle stumps used to be cartwheeling past the wicketkeeper. <laughs> Anyway, Greg got out to the middle and he took Lexton guard off me and in came holding past me first ball to Greg. And he just bowled him a medium pace, just a medium pace, half volley on the line of the off stump. And Greg led over head and shoulder and left leg onto the line of the ball. And with the full face of the bat, Greg hit it through the offside for four. It was a magnificent shot. And all the English supporters at the over were on the feet chanting, Greg, 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 Greg. And as the ball came back through the West Indies players, tossed the ball back to Holding, and Holding walked past me, polishing the ball. And as he walked past me, he said, Dickie, I said, just man. <laughs> he said, get ready. <laughs> <laughs> he said, get ready this ball. <laughs> so down I got. <laughs> he went back many a mile. I thought, where's he going? That was at the Vauxhall end at the Oval. I thought, where's he going? And when he got to end his run, he said, ready, man. I said, I'm ready, Michael. <laughs> and in came holding past me. Well, I never saw it. I never saw the ball. I was going to say I was right to death stood there as the umpire. I never saw it. <laughs> I, all I saw was Greggy with his back up here somewhere, wherever. It? And the next thing I saw, Greg's leg and middle stumps were cartwheeling past the wicketkeeper. Now it was the turn of the West Indies supporters, holding at ball Greg. It was the last test of the series, they'd won the series, and they were throwing the Bacardi rum bottles and the Coca-Cola cans all over Oval. We were all ducking and weaving it middle. 
Death came on the field, did the West Indies supporters in their thousands. You couldn't see a blade of grass for Bacardi rum bottles, Coca-Cola cans, West Indies supporters all over the Oval. It always happens to me, doesn't it? Eh? I mean, they blame me for everything. The sheer pace of holding can be seen on from the batsman's view on YouTube clips of the match. And the ball that bowls Tony Gregg in the second innings is quite astonishing. He finished the innings with 6 for 57, giving him a match total of 14 for 149, as England were bowled out for 203, losing the series 3-0. Tony Gregg, it should be noted, did not lose his sense of humour in spite of the humiliating loss, and played on his grovel comment, uh, pretending to crawl on his hands and knees in front of the open stands on the far side of the oval, delighting the West Indian fans who had jeered him for much of the series. The outcome of the series was that the West Indies were on track for a period of unprecedented dominance that would ultimately last through until the early 1990s, built on flamboyant attacking batting, strong leadership and extreme pace bowling, often operating with four quicks capable of operating well over 90 miles an hour. The Australian team under Ian Chappell had paved the way for this style of play, though injury to Jeff Thompson and the distraction of Kerry Packer with World Series cricket would prevent them from reaching the heights of the mid-70s as the decade came to a close. The ICC met long, not long after the 1976 series, having received multiple complaints about the trend of hostile fast bowling and the threat of injury or even death if it were to continue. In response, they urged umpires to enforce the rules around managing short-pitch bowling more rigorously. Alongside this, the following year saw the introduction of the very first helmets in cricket, a protective technology that would continue to evolve in safety through to the present day. For England, several of the players involved in the series would not feature again, including Brian Close and David Steele, despite the latter being surprisingly voted the BBC Sports Personality of the Year in 1976 in recognition of his bravery against the West Indian pace attack. As for Tony Gregg, he led the team to a victory in India later that year and then captained the side to a narrow loss in the centenary test in Melbourne in 1977, where it's worth noting that Australia won the historic match by the same 45-run margin as the very first test 100 years previously. With the lure of World Series cricket under Kerry Packer around the corner, Greg's England career would ultimately be cut short, and indeed, he would play his last match for England in the summer of 1977 in the home victory against Australia, the captaincy having gone to Mike Brearley. However, as part of a group of young, talented players, there would be another charismatic all-rounder ready to come and take his place, one whose achievements would quickly surpass that of any previous English all-rounder. Now he will provide the focus for the next episode of Gods and Flannelled Fools. Until then, thank you for listening, thank you for subscribing and sharing. Bye for now.